Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so um, I was asked to talk about updates and ischemic stroke, and I'm going to be biased and say that um, ischemic probably stroke is one of the most growing fields in neurology overall. So what's there really to consider as an update? Personally, for me, I want something that would either change my practice in the future, it would answer some of the questions or emphasize some of the things that we are doing right now without a level A evidence or bring out more questions and more debates asking for more RCTs in the future so that we get a better answer. I have no disclosures. So I divided my talk predominantly into the reperfusion therapy where I will be talking about um, EVT with thrombolysis or without thrombolysis. I'll briefly discuss also the extending time window for IV thrombolysis, speaking about TNK. And then at the end, I'll just talk about this and TST as a stroke prevention um, updates. So we know that IVTPA doesn't really work for those with the long segment. It has limited time window, and that's when EVT came on as a big hit for us. Now, the question is whether we need to combine it or not. So what happened is when we try to do the combination, we actually, the idea is we may be able to facilitate those endovascular reperfusion. We may be able to dissolve those distal clots that I'm not going to be able to reach with a thrombectomy. However, at the same time, we know that combining IVTPA with EVT, the idea is it will increase um, the risk of having cerebral hemorrhage or other extra cerebral uh, bleeds. It will limit my use for antithrombotic afterwards, especially if there's any plan to do any stenting or intervention in the acute phase period. It can delay the start of EVT because not, um, not all um, transfer ambulances are actually ICU equipped ones, so they don't necessarily will have the pump. And there have been some facilities where they will actually have to wait until TPA is completed before they're able to shift the patients for places with endovascular therapy available. And at the same time, they, we think they may have some limited effect on those large clots, so it will just uh, dissolve those clots or break them down, and then it will have some distal occlusion, further complicating the distal perfusion. The first study I'm going to talk about is uh, direct MT, which is um, one of the uh, most recent RCT that has discussed combining IV, TPA, and the thrombectomy versus thrombectomy alone. It happened in China. The main inclusion had been for older than 18 years old. The, inclusion, the occlusions have been including um, intracranial ICA, M1, M2 segments, or both. Um, they would do it within four and a half hours of ITP, IV TPA so that we are still within the window. And they only wanted an IHSS of two or more, and they didn't really take into consideration the aspect. Overall, 656 patients have been enrolled in this trial, and the population have been similar uh, between those with EVT group versus combined group. The median age was approximately 69 years old. 56.4% were men. The median NIHSS score was 17, so even though they wanted to include all those about NIH of 2, they did eventually get quite a severe stroke with a very good aspect of 9. Interestingly, if you look at the time between randomization to drawn puncture, for the EBT alone, it was only 31 minutes, whereas the combined was 36 minutes. So it really just caused a five minutes of delay from starting the EBT. Of those um, 656 patients, so 591 underwent thrombectomy uh, or EBT, where there was an actual contact between the, um, like after the bone puncture with the clot itself with some sort of devices. And in the combination group where they received both, note that about 86.5% um, completed during EVT. So it wasn't like we needed to wait to see if the IVTPA had worked before we actually go ahead with EVT. And this one did actually confirm the non-inferiority of thrombectomy alone to combination of thrombectomy and IVTPA with the confidence um, interval of 0.81. So it just barely passed the um, confidence interval of 0.8 that was required for the non-inferiority. And this is why they did not go ahead with looking into the superiority. Um, otherwise, looking for, into the secondary outcomes, the only one that was actually significant was for where they tried to look into the successful reperfusion before thrombectomy, and it was found to be higher in those with a combined treatment. For the safety outcome, it really did not affect it any significantly, but you can see a higher trend toward those with a combined. And in, from this one, we can conclude, uh, this Chinese one, that overall there was non-inferiority confirmed and it did not really have any significant effect on the symptomatic ICH or the mortality. 
The second one is a skip that was predominantly in Japan. So remember that Japan guidelines actually state for IVTPA dosage to be 0.6 mg per kit. The other inclusion have been for ICA occlusion or M1. They did not include the Lisa, mera chala hai aspect also of six and more. And they only included 204 patients of which were divided between, between uh, mechanical thrombectomy and the combined. Similarly, uh, the media NIHSS was of 18, so it was a still quiet, a severe stroke with a good aspect. The predominant vessel occlusion had been for the M1. And from this one, 199 patients went for um, the actual mechanical thrombectomy again. And when we compared the randomization to puncture time, it was not statistically significant between the two groups. Even the rate of clot migration, which was one of the concerns that we talked about earlier, was not significantly different between the two groups. So in this one, neither the primary analysis nor the per protocol analysis confirmed any non-inferiority. So this was not proven here. Um, if we try to look into the secondary outcome, Again, it, there is like some trend toward, um, yeah, there is some trend um, toward similar to what we just said in the previous study with the ticky perfusion being better for those with a combined, but none of it actually was significant. For the adverse outcome, the significant results had been for any ICH within 36 hours. So that was already a plan CT at 36 hours that looked into it and found to have more bleed. However, if you look into the symptomatic bleeds by an into criteria or most, none of them have had significant difference between the two. The last trial regarding the combined EVT and IVTPA is the uh, DEVT ones, which was again, another multi sector randomized controlled trial in China. The including vessels have been for intracranial ICA or ammonia occlusion, and patients would be eligible for IVTPA within four and a half hours, similar to what we have just said. And the number that was included in this trial had been 234 patients um, of this one. Similarly, like the NIHSS had been about 16 for both groups, so we're still taking the severe stroke. This trial was terminated early because they did reach the threshold for non-inferiority. So according to the steering committee and the safety, they thought it was reasonable to stop it just because the evidence was so out there. So the non-inferiority was actually demonstrated for ABT alone compared with a combined with a p-value of 0.003. If we look into the disability, uh, so it has a zero for an assist difference with the confidence interval of minus one to zero. Uh, the bleeding risk overall using the um, HBC criteria actually did not show much. It just showed it to be similar to the skip one that we just talked about, in spite of the skip one using a 0.6 mg per kg for TPA dosages. Mortality, again, no significant difference. So we have so far some studies that did prove non-inferiority, other studies that did not prove non-inferiority. We still have some ongoing study, including direct safe and swift direct as well. Mr. Clean, no IV trial results have been uh, preliminary published in ISC conference this year only. And again, it did not show non-inferiority nor superiority for the combined, uh, sorry, for the um, EBT alone over the combined. So overall, what we will do at the time being is still will, will offer the IV TPA prior to proceeding with EBT. Now, briefly, we'll talk about the extending thrombolysis time window. So we already, by now, know there has been quite a few publications that had shown the efficacy of TPA for those who present more than half, four and a half hour window from the onset, the wake up strokes, and the on onset. Depending on the type of imaging that we do, whether we did the MRI um, with DWI versus a flare comparison, or we were depending on the perfusion images with their CTP or MRP. And this has shifted our definition from time-based to tissue-based for a stroke window. I'm just gonna talk about this meta-analysis by Dr. Campbell and his group, where they looked into the four and a half to nine hours time window, including three studies, extend. So that was the one that looked into uh, between four and a half hour to nine hours. The study was uh, terminated early. And similar thing with the ECAS-4 also was um, terminated early and epithet, which looked into four and a half to six hours. So combined population that they got was about 414 patients. Half of them have been wake up strokes. And about 403 of those have had some vessel imaging done, and we would have estimated about 61% of those would have been candidate for thrombectomy, but because all those trials were done before thrombectomy was part of the guidelines, so it was not really included in those. Now, if we try to look into the median perfusion of mismatch, it was 47 ml. The median volume of critical hypoperfusion on the uh, perfusion scan was 64 ml, and the relatively small core uh, median volume was 8. 
And overall, this was quite a positive for the primary outcome as well as secondary outcome. So this just emphasized that we can still give TPA if we extend the time window, have we had the right imaging. And then they try to use those patients specifically who have had automated rapid software because this is the most common one that has been used. And so they included 304 patients with those. And again, this was further emphasized and they noted that those who have had perfusion imaging actually with the, through the rapid actually have had better compared to those who have not had it. And sorry, just because uh, before I continue further on, please note that I know that earlier on, MRI had a big role for it, but just remember that sometimes when we use MRI alone with that actually depending on our perfusion, we may still miss some patients that have we had CT perfusion for would have been candidate for the delayed time window, whereas in MRI, they would still have shown the high flare signal. Um, the last one for the acute reperfusion therapies will be TNK, which is quite a hot topic, and I'm very optimistic for future use of TNK. So this is a genetically modified TPA with three different point of mutation. It has higher affinity for fibrin. It has longer half-life than TPA. It already has been established for coronary syndromes, where it would have equal efficacy to um, TPA and lower major bleeds. The beauty about TNK is that you give it as a bolus over um, five seconds. And you don't need to have that pump, at least for the ship and drip uh, issues that we have discussed earlier. Again, multiple trials did come out that showed efficacy, um, that tried to show uh, efficacy or at least non inferiority. One of them had been Nortest. So Nortest used somewhat of a minor uh, or mild strokes, but this did prove the safety of uh, TNK rather than the. Uh, non-inferiority for it. The um, extend IATNK use it predominantly prior to um, thrombectomy. I'm just going to focus on this meta-analysis that has included the big trials for um, T and K overall. So you'll notice that um, the overall have had different inclusion criteria with different median NIHSs for them. Um, there is even a, a different dosages for the T and K among them, but the median NIHSs overall combined those studies have been about seven. So we're still not quite the severe stroke. And it did show uh, a high uh, probability, uh, sorry, it did show non-inferiority of TNK compared to TPA within the different dosages that were included. Similar thing when they tried to look for the um, secondary outcome with the functional independence, there was a still a trend present there with uh, confirming a non-inferiority of two of the um, endpoints compared to the third one. So they had like a three margins for the non-inferiority and it only confirmed two. If you look into the uh, bleeds overall, it didn't really show much. Um, and then there is this most recent that was published last year where they tried to compare the different dosages of T and K 0.4 versus 0.25, because those were some of the doses, dosages that were used earlier on, and they didn't find any extra benefit if we have increased the dose to 0.4. And this is why the guidelines currently emphasize on T and K of 0.25. So in 2019, that was the most recent AHA, it did say it, it is reasonable to choose TNK over IVTPA if there is no contraindication for thrombolysis for those who will go for mechanical thrombectomy. ESO was published only this year, and they actually at like um, acknowledged or suggested that TNK would be used over TPA for those uh, prior going to um, thrombectomy. We still have, again, some ongoing trials to see if we can use TNK instead of TPA as a first line for thrombolytic and stroke patients, regardless of thrombectomy. Um, regarding the prevention, I'll just briefly talk about TAILS. So TAILS actually have been um, a, quite a good RCT uh, most recent publish, again, comparing a dual antiplatelet with the Cagrel and aspirin versus aspirin for those patients with non-cardiombolic minor stroke with NIHS score of five or less or high risk PIA defined by ABCD2 score six or more, or if they have had an associated epsilateral atherosclerotic stenosis of 50% or more. The randomization time period had been within 24 hours. They would only need to have um, brain imaging that have excluded ICH overall. And in this one, about 11,000 patients have been included in the trial. And during this trial, they did still try to control for other significant um, risk factors, like the hypertension, statin use, glucose control as well. And otherwise, the population between the two have been quite similar from baseline characteristics. And they did find if you use the combined Ticagro and aspirin, it would actually improve the stroke or death as a primary outcome. And this is likely driven by the improvement in the stroke rate within the um, first time period monitored. 
And furthermore, from this tales, they tried to do a sub-analysis where they wanted to see that benefit for those patients specifically with atherosclerotic diseases. So that was defined as patients with symptomatic intracranial or extracranial arterial stenosis, those with 30% or more for uh, narrowing in the diameter of the artery that have accounted for the presentation, irrespective of the aortic arch plaque. Of that, of approximately 20% of TAILS population had been included in this trial, and they did find, uh, again, positive results that the primary outcome had been reduced in those patients who have had dual and like ticagrelin and aspirin compared with aspirin alone, with the number needed to treat of 34. And even if you want to compare it with those with intracranial arterial versus those without, sorry, those with um, atherosclerotic compared to those without, they still found the benefit is higher in those with atherosclerotic patients. Um, again, similarly, the primary outcome had been significant for those driven predominantly by the ischemic stroke. And again, interestingly, the disabling stroke also had been improved when you do the dual antiplatelets with the tagrel for those patients. And then they tried to compare specifically intracranial versus extracranial, and they found that the benefit is more so with the intracranial, more significant at least. So this is now becoming an option for us to consider in such situation. In the subgroup analysis, they found that Asians tend to benefit the most and those who have weighted less than 70 kilo. Now, another subgroup analysis that tried to look into preventing disabling the stroke, as I mentioned earlier, because this was found to be positive in those with atherosclerotic uh, patients. And we know from Point and Chas that aspirin and Plavix would reduce your chance of having stroke, of having MI, of having cardiovascular death, but it didn't really look into reducing the stability overall. So taking into in the same population, they found that there was improvement in those patients with MRS more than one at 30 days with the number needed to treat of 133 patients. Similar thing for ischemic stroke related uh, disability for their secondary outcome. Also, it was significantly present uh, with the number needed to treat of 112. And we have an ongoing trial, which will be quite interesting chance too, where they will be comparing uh, ticagrelin and aspirin versus uh, Plavix and aspirin, because as you all probably know, there has been some debates about Plavix because of this um, uh, genetic susceptibility that not all patients will be able to respond to Plavix as good. Last but not least is treat tar uh, stroke to target. So uh, this one was another RCT that focused predominantly on treating the level of the LDL rather than giving the optimal dose of atorvastatin in those patients. This was predominantly meant to be in France, but because of the slow recruitment, eventually they added South Korea to it. Again, uh, they wanted patients with an indication for um, LDL control. So those will be patients with atherosclerotic disease, with their intracranial or extracranial cerebral, or they have had even FC or contralateral related to their presentation, if they have had aortic arch plaque, if they have history of coronary artery disease, and if there is any recommendation uh, in the guidelines that will emphasize this patient need to be on statin or on controlled LDL level. And the groups that they had was for LDL less than 70, so that's LDL less than 1.8, and the other group for the higher target is 90 to 110, so so that's 2.3 to 2.8. Similar thing, they also try to control for other risk factors like hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure and encouraging smoking cessation. So this had approximately 2,860 patients and um, majority have had uh, only um, stats in use, but in about a third for those with the uh, lower target, a 5.8 and those with a higher target did have the addition of azitimab now added on as well. Just if you look um, the interesting part at the uh, baseline characteristic between the two, you note that the where the second star is, the LDL cholesterol at baseline was actually quite similar between the two groups. Again, as I mentioned, this trial was stopped early because of the lack of funding and the slow enrollment even after adding um, Korea later. And F medium follow-up. So this is actually quite interesting. So overall, for those with the lower target, they found that the mean LDL was 65 in the lower target and 96 in the higher target. So both kind of had the um, a low or a good control overall of 1.7 versus 2.5 is really what we've been trying to compare at the time being. And the time spent in that target that they wanted about 50% in the lower target and 30% in the higher target group. Now, another interesting point is for those who have been meant to be in the lower target, almost a half of them were actually above the target and the higher target to group, almost a half of them have been below the target. If you look into the major cardiovascular event as a primary outcome, it was more uh, prevented or less, at least in the lower target group. 
and just note that it did not really have any significance of increasing the intracranial hemorrhage that has been always a concern with uh, lowering LDL or being on statin. This, uh, another paper that was published that tried to look into the long-term effect of actually having those patients being kept on those targets. And it was mainly on the France population because that was the one that had started earlier on. And um, similar thing, you know, that with those patients less than 70 and in those with 100 received uh, overall statin and it's map in different percentages. And they noted that those patients who were meant to be in the lower target, again, about 47% have had a target higher than 70, and those assigned to a higher target have had 34% uh, actually at the uh, lower than the target emphasized for that group. But again, same thing, the major cardiovascular events were less in those with the lower target. And interestingly, also, you note that the cerebral infarction or carotid cerebral artery vascularization from the secondary outcome also was less in those with the lower target. And uh, the overall emphasis here was that if you spend more time in that target, so it wasn't just about starting a higher dose overall, as I mentioned earlier, you will have more benefit from that lower target. Um, again, just here to emphasize one more time that intracranial hemorrhage has not been significantly different. The out primary outcome on intracranial, when they tried to look at it combined, it was significant, but again, this is probably led more by the primary outcome rather than by the intracranial hemorrhage. And just a quick reminder that um, we have different guidelines, and I know we don't have anything specific to Kuwait at least or to our region, so it is it can be quite challenging to know which guideline to stick with, how to follow those updates and what. So you notice that ESO and SOAR Foundation, which is the Australian one, tend to be the most updated overall. They just do it quite quicker compared with North American ones. But I am interested to see what AHA has to say about all those updates that we have talked about. So in summary, the question of EBT, whether we still need to give IV thrombolysis to or not, it's a yes. We still do give IV thrombolysis because we don't have any strong evidence that confirm non-inferiority, but we do have some ongoing trials to look further into it. The extended time window for thrombolysis, again, we just need to remember that this is still possible with the help of radiology and appropriate imaging, and that will be CT perfusion or MR perfusion. The next place, it is an option prior to... Um, thrombectomy, especially for the drip and ship, the dose is 0.25 meg per keg with a maximum of 25. For the ticagrel and aspirin versus aspirin, so this is a good option for dual antiplatelet for those with minor strokes with NIHSS less than 5 or with a high-risk uh, TIA. Uh, the benefit seems to be quite better for the or quite significant for those with in, like atherosclerotic. So this can be a consideration when you want to question when would you use the Plavix aspirin versus the Cagrel aspirin. And right now, I think it is reasonable to target LDL rather than just to start on a high dose of statin. And don't be scared to add on as it's map if the uh, primary uh, target of LDL has not been reached. Last but not least, uh, I just want to congratulate Kuwait uh, for having uh, started on a thrombectomy. This is our first case shared between Jabir Hospital uh, and between our intervention team at Ibn Sina Hospital for a young COVID patient with NIHSS of 18 that after the help of Dr. Uh, Lazar, Dr. Peter, and of course the leadership and all of this, Dr. Lemia, who were able to actually drop down his NIHSS to two with MRS of zero and he's functioning excellent right now. Uh, so hopefully this is a bright future for Kuwait overall and looking for more cases of those to come. Thank you very much. If patient has not been on aspirin prior to the stroke, you should always load them with aspirin prior to actually um, giving them the 81 milligram. If they have been on aspirin prior to the stroke, I would just continue it as an 81 milligram because they already have, have it in their system. So it's not going to add anything extra. And we know that the high dose daily aspirin does not really add any extra benefit to the 81. If patients are already on aspirin, I wouldn't load. If they are not on aspirin before and I want to start it, I would load them.
it's just a loading dose, right? So we just want to get it in their system faster. Because if you started with the AT1, it is going to take some day for it to actually kick in. But I thought I thought the evidence there was no clear evidence for this though. On I, I mean on a, a randomized control trial. It's something based on case series or stroke specialists who do this, right? This is not something supported on evidence, right? It is. Uh, okay. So there is an evidence for people who are aspirin naive, you load them with aspirin. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So they did look into it. It is a good option. It doesn't add extra benefits. Like I wouldn't take it as an option for dual antiplatelet, right? I would just take it as an alternative to aspirin if you want to. I know vascular tend to like it more for the peripheral vascular disease than a neurologist for a stroke. So if patient comes to me on it, I will keep him if I need a mono antiplatelet overall as a plan. However, if I need a dual antiplatelet, I will go with the Plavix or Ticagrelor for those patients. I don't think I would start it for my sore patients. Is the reason for that the side effect profile? It, it, it didn't show any extra benefit or any significant extra benefit in prevention. Thank you very much, Dr. Adan. Yeah. So I would like to uh, 